Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's IDA Motivational Monday educational webinar. My name is Janet Tebow. I have the pleasure of being your host today. I also serve as the branch council chair for, um, for all of IDA's branches. Today's webinar is morphology, important from the beginning. Today, we're gonna to discuss the importance of morphology in early instruction, along with some ideas for teachers so that you can integrate morphology into your systematic literacy instruction. But before we get started with the workshop, I will have some announcements to share with you. I wanna invite you to check our website, social media, and eblast for more information on IDA's upcoming Motivational Mondays. You can also watch previously recorded Motivational Mondays via IDA's digital library at dyslexialibrary.org. You should also check out idatv.org to view our latest content, special collections, and power sessions. IDA's 2021 annual Reading Literacy and Learning Conference will be at the Charlotte Convention Center in Charlotte, North Carolina this October 21st through 23rd. This year we are offering attendees limited space on site and unlimited opportunities to view the conference via IDA TV. Teachers, researchers, parents, advocates, and therapists are all invited to learn, network, and gain the tools you need to help people with dyslexia live successful, productive lives. Visit dyslexiacon.org for more information about this great conference, and please plan on joining us either in person or in virtual land. I'd now like to introduce our presenter. Sue Hegland is an author and frequent speaker on topics related to spelling. She teaches teachers and other people who attend her workshops how to provide explicit, systematic instruction in written English and highlights the importance of morphology and the influences of etymology. Her early professional experience was in experimental research and instructional design, but her focus shifted in 2003 when she learned that one of her children is dyslexic. She was trained in the Orton-Gillingham approach and she served as on the board of directors for IDA's Upper Midwest Branch and on the Board of Education for the Brandon Valley School District. Sue is currently Editor-in-Chief for IDA's Fact Sheets publications, and she's the author of the website learningaboutspelling.com. Please join me in welcoming Sue, and I'm going to have the pleasure of turning this over to you so you can take it away now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Janet. I'm really glad to be here with you, and I'm going to share my slides with you so we can begin talking about morphology. Um, so we're, our topic today is the idea of morphology, but we're in particular going to focus on the idea that this is important from the very beginning of instruction. So we've known for a long time, IDA has known that morphology is important as a component of structured literacy um, forever. And it's always been recognized that this is an important topic as students become more advanced in their reading and spelling skills. So we've seen this as something that's important from third grade on or after kids have kind of developed the foundational skills they need for reading. But what's happening now is we're realizing that morphology is actually much more integral to the whole reading and writing process and needs to be integrated into everything we do from the very beginning. I'm gonna give you a couple of uh, quotes. This is from Marcia Henry who wrote in IDA's Perspectives on Language and Literacy back in uh, the spring of 2019. She said that in the past 35 years, especially in the current decade, research in the area of morphology has continued to evolve. And she talks a little bit about how that research has evolved. And you might want to go take a look at that and see what she has to, to reference there about research. But her, her conclusion was the work of many researchers and educators illustrates the need to introduce morphology, which was once thought to be useful only in the upper elementary and secondary grades in the early grades. So she's talking about this idea of what research is now showing us that this needs to be part of instruction from very early on. Louisa Motz in her most recent edition of Speech to Print wrote, recent research indicates that morphological awareness is associated with reading and spelling growth from first grade onward in parallel with phoneme awareness and general print knowledge. So th these um, experts on reading are reiterating what we're learning from research, which is that we want to begin to integrate morphology in our work from the very beginning. So morphology is very important and it's needed earlier than we may realize 
because it frames the entire spelling system. It allows us to understand what's going on with the spelling of words, which then unlocks aspects, all aspects really of reading and comprehension. It also frames the work that we do with phoneme graphing relationships. We know that it is critical to explicitly teach kids how to analyze the phonemes, the segments of pronunciation that are meaningful in spoken words, and connect that to the graphemes, the letters and the combinations of letters that spell those phonemes in written words. We know that we have to teach this. Morphology is what allows us to make sense of it, to have kids understand why one particular grapheme is in a word and not another, along with etymology. The influences of etymology are also very important, but morphology is just hugely important even on its own. And the, one of the points about this is it has to really be integrated into what we're doing. We don't want to have a session where we're talking to kids about phoneme graphing relationships and then do something separate on morphology. The, the, the goal is to bring it all together so that we see how all of these things work together to, to um, help us understand how spelling works. And one of the things about this is that this is especially powerful for dyslexic students. We want to provide really clean, clear instruction for dyslexic kids, systematic, explicit, so that they can really master these things and, and understand what's going on. And morphology, rather than being a complicating factor, is actually something that makes that clearer and easier. So we're going to start then by talking, we're gonna, so we're going to talk about all those things today, but I want to start by clearing up a few definitions, making sure we're on the same page. So many of you would know this, but what is a morpheme? Well, a morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit of language. And by that, I mean both spoken language and written language. So we have morphemes, it's kind of a conceptual term. We have them in spoken language, we have them in written language. And, an ex and when it's a written morpheme, we, we talk about it as an element. So a written morpheme is an element. So an example of a morpheme would be the P-L-A-N-T that we pronounce plant that is a free base that means something, right? And we talk about this as the smallest meaningful unit of language because if we take away any part of that written element or that spoken word, because this is a free base element that can be spoken as a word, then it doesn't mean the same thing. So if I take away the P, I get lant, and that doesn't mean anything. If I take away the p and the o, I get ant. That means something totally different. So a morpheme is indivisible in terms of its contribution to the meaning of words in English. Um, oh, I had that little arrow there and then I forgot to talk about it. But I had the arrow there to remind me that I wanted to tell you that these angle brackets in anything you see that I'm presenting here means that we're talking about a spelled or a written form. So the P-L-A-N-T then represents that spelling as opposed to the the pronunciation or the meaning of that word. So we have we can have single morphemes that can form words, but we also often combine morphemes to form words. So we can take that base element that's free, that forms the word plant, P-L-A-N-T, and combine it with a prefix R-E and get replant. We can combine it with I-N-G and get replanting or just planting if we just took those two. So replanting as a word consists of three morphemes and we can see the spoken representations. Uh, the spoken word has a written representation. The other way to talk about a morpheme is comes from language files. And I really like this definition because it, it says it is the smallest linguistic unit that has a meaning or a grammatical function. Because sometimes we think about morphemes as always having meaning, but you can think about that ing suffix. It doesn't really have a meaning by itself, but what it does is it contributes grammatical information to a word that it's added to. So it's contributing um, some grammatical information. It has a grammatical function. So often prefixes and suffixes um, contribute something that has helps us understand the grammar of a word, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have a specific meaning. So then what is morphology then? Well, morphology is the study of morphemes. It's the study of these structures in language that come together to form words. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about morphology using a tool from orthographic linguistics that's really useful called an orthographic morphological word sum. And here's an example. So we can take this word morphology, this written word, M-O-R-P-H-O-L-O-G-Y, and analyze it into four elements. We have a base element, M-O-R-P-H. We have a connecting vowel letter O. 
we have a base LOG, and we have a suffix Y. Now, we, we may be used to thinking about that O-L-O-G-Y as one unit, and that's fine, but it's also interesting to know that we can analyze that further, that this L-O-G is a bound base. It's not the free base that we think of as a log that we might find laying in the forest. Um, it's an L-O-G that we can combine with I-C to get a word like logic. So this shows us an analysis where we have a free base, a connecting vowel letter, a bound base, and a suffix coming together to form a word. And we can look at that with orthograph an orthographic morphological word sum or just a word sum. And here we have an analytic word sum where we're taking a word and we're showing how it can be analyzed. We can also create synthetic word sums where we take the elements that are individually going to create a word and show how they are synthesized or brought together to create a word. Um, in this talk, I'm going to use the terms base element anytime we're talking about a base like M-O-R-P-H or L-O-G, regardless of the language of origin that it comes from, regardless of whether it can be um, a free bait, can stand by, uh, create a word by itself or not, sometimes you will see terms like um, a base word or um, a combining form for, for elements that come from Greek or roots that come from Latin. But I'm just going to talk about base elements and then also affixes. And it, I'll use the term free or bound to indicate whether they can be a word by themselves or not. And I use the term root along with many of my colleagues just when talking about etymology. It really clears things up if I talk about something as a Latin root because then you know I'm talking about the history of the word as opposed to the structure of the word today. That Latin root may lead to a bound base in English today, but that helps us know whether we're talking morphology or etymology. It's just clarifying. Uh, and it's a uh, convention that you'll notice in this talk. So. I have to move my thing so I can see myself or see that what I'm where I am. So now we're looking at an orthographic morphological matrix. That is another um, research tool that we can use from orthographic linguistics. And what a matrix is, is a way to represent morphemes, written morphemes, elements, so that you can see a whole collection of words that can be formed from one particular base. In this case, the M-O-R-P-H, that has this idea of shape or form. So in a matrix, you will see a base element in the center. And typically, it's really helpful to spell a base because, for example, uh, for example, um, well, let, I'm not going to give you an example now. I'm just going to mention that when we, what we're going to be looking at today is the idea that base elements may often shift their pronunciation as they combine with various other elements. And so it really is helpful to get in the habit of spelling elements because first of all, it gives us lots of practice thinking about those spellings, but it also is the most clear way of identifying what an element actually is. So we always wanna spell a base, we've got M-O-R-P-H, and a base will have an orthographic denotation. This is an interesting term that is used to describe kind of the deep meaning that is carried in a base. It is not the same thing as the surface definition of that particular base if it happens to be a word, but it comes from its history and we will notice that deep sense embedded in any word that's going to have that base in it. We'll look at an example in just a minute. Then we can have prefixes. So we have the prefixes here coming before this M-O-R-P-H and we have suffixes that come after it. And sometimes we have secondary bases that are also in a uh, matrix, which are going to also be in um, typically represented with bold, so you can tell that that's a base. Okay, so once we have our matrix, then we can work with it. And I want to talk just one minute more about this orthographic denotation. So often we think about the idea that etymology has influenced the meaning of words, but what a word meant in Latin, what it meant in Greek is not necessarily the same thing that it means in English today because language is constantly evolving. So an orthographic denotation is a super useful way to think about this deep sense and meaning that's embedded in a word. So sometimes it's very close to the surface meaning today or the, or the meaning that we have today. So for example, this M-O-R-P-H with an idea of shape or form, which comes from its history, we can see that really clearly in a word like amorphous. If we talk about something being amorphous, we mean it is without any shape. It's just kind of shapeless. But then think about morphology. So morphology, where we have this L-O-G that gives this idea of study or reason, 
the study of morphemes. Well, we're not really talking about studying the literal shape of a word. We're talking, I mean, we're talking about studying the structure of the word. So it's it's evolved a little bit in how it's used, but it does have that same idea, that deep sense of shape or form. So an orthographic denotation is not a literal meaning. It's something that is contributing to, even in a faint way, to the present use of a word. But it's it can really unlock multiple meanings of words and deepen our understanding of vocabulary, as you'll see as we go along. So. Words are formed by combining written elements. That's what we start with with morphology. But the other thing to know is that written elements combine consistently. So in the word phoneme or morpheme or grapheme, we're just, excuse me, in grapheme or, or uh, morpheme, we're just adding the EME to get the, um, the completed word. But sometimes we have to apply the three suffixing conventions that we know from um, all of our structured literacy work. So sometimes we might replace an E as we do in phoneme. We might change a Y to an I as we do in cried. And we might um, double the P as we do to get the word slipper. So we see these suffixing conventions being applied and they are applied extremely consistently. If you notice something that seems like, oh, maybe we're changing a D to an S or an S to a D, there's, there's something else going on that morphology will often explain because what we find is that when we look at morphology, these three conventions explain the construction of just about every word. If these conventions are not followed, there is a reason that we can understand. So you may, you're probably familiar with these. If you're part of the structured literacy world, you probably understand these suffix and conventions well. But if this is new to you, there is a webinar that a colleague and I gave a few years ago available free to watch at the Upper Midwest branch of IDA where we go into those three suffix and conventions. So here's where we start with structured literacy. We know that the framework of spelling is morphology. We know that words are formed by combining morphological units and that we do that using consistent suffix and conventions. Anyone who's a structured literacy practitioner is gonna be very familiar with this and do this a lot. Here's the part of morphology that is so exciting and that really unlocks so much of spelling. And that is the, the fact that morphological elements in English are going to be spelled consistently whenever possible, even though their pronunciation will often vary. Now, we know this because when we look at a suffix like ed, we know that it can be pronounced three different ways. When we look at a suffix like s, we know that it can be pronounced two different ways, but it's always spelled the same. And the reason is because we want to be able to see those units of meaning in written words and instantly understand what that contributes to our comprehension of the word, either a particular deep orthographic denotation or um, some sort of a grammatical function. And these are gonna be consistent throughout the system. So we know that this happens, but what we don't always realize is how often it happens. It's all over the place. And we're gonna look at some examples of that. So the fact is the reason we're talking about the need to introduce morphology immediately is that we want students to be thinking about structures along with pronunciation. They have to understand the relationships between pronunciation and spelling. They have to be able to analyze pronunciation and to be able to analyze spelling and see how they connect, but structures are going to allow them to understand the why. So we want them thinking about this from the beginning. So I'm going to share with you a couple of spelling errors that are nice illustrations of the importance of morphology. And I'm going to use a student letter to do this. So this was a letter an eighth grade student wrote. The student is a good student, doesn't, isn't probably very dyslexic, but does have some difficulties with spelling from time to time. So see what you think of this. She writes, Dear Grandma and Grandpa, how are you doing? I am great. In English, we are writing letters to relatives, and I chose to send mine to you. I hope you enjoy reading about what's going on here with me in South Dakota. We are doing a lot in school right now. In English and computer, we are working on this letter. In science, we have recently been working on dissections and have now moved on to owl pellets. It's very educational, but very disgusting. Math is still pretty fun. I'm having a little bit of trouble on remembering how to graph linear equations, but I still have a solid A. And then she goes on to talk about geography. So clearly the student is very good at writing. She's very good at spelling, but she's got some fabulous spelling errors in here that really show us how morphology can make the things that are the most challenging make the most sense. So she's misspelled writing. And here she clearly is not thinking about pronunciation or maybe doesn't even understand that an I followed by two Ts is definitely gonna be short. There's something going on there, but think how if she just were thinking right, 
W-R-I-T-E plus I-N-G, and uses her suffix and convention, she would have known how to spell that word. That's the easy one. Then we get relatives, where she's got a schwa for that, that second E that she's written here, is, is an, a neutral, barely pronounced vowel, which is very common. In fact, it's the most common vowel pronunciation in English words. So how does she know that relatives is supposed to be an A based on the way she pronounces it? She really can't. She doesn't know, she doesn't realize that she needs two S in dissections and Y. And this is my favorite error, educational with that extra J in there. All the letters we need in educational, but then a J stuck in there just to be safe because we pronounce that edge and she's thinking maybe a J, and then equations. And what do we teach kids? How do we teach kids to spell Jean, equation, S-I-O-N, and she's done exactly what we've told her. So there is, but there's so much that morphology can, so many ways that morphology can clarify these. So we're gonna look at these together. So morphology is gonna explain very frequently the schwa, why we need to spell R-E-L-A-T-I-V-E and not R-E-L-E-T-I-V-E. And this little asterisk here means that this is not the attested spelling. This is a spelling error in this case. So what is it that helps us understand that? It's looking at the structure. So we have R-E plus L-A-T-E, replace that E with I-V-E and S and we get relatives. Now, often when we look at a word like relatives or relate, we might think, well, that looks like a prefix R-E, but I know that's not the word late, right? Because the word late we have in English, it means tardy or slow. And we might make words like lately or uh, later, or even belated has to do with this, comes from the same base. This is a free base element, but it turns out there is another base or basal construction. There's always a chance when we have an ATE that we can remove an ATE, even when there's only one or two um, consonants left. But in this case, we're going to look at this as a, as a suffixal, or excuse me, a basal construction, a base that has this idea of born or, or carried. It's related to the F-E-R that's in transfer and prefer and things like that. It comes from the same Latin verb. So these are what are called homographic base elements. So we often have this in English. We don't have a lot of homographic words in English, words that are spelled the same, but mean different things, come from different origins. But we often will find homographic base elements. In this case, we have a free base and we have a bound base that are spelled the same, but mean completely different things. So we, when we look at um, relate, we have to ask ourselves, wait a minute, could that be something other than the word late that I'm thinking of? Clearly that's not the base, but maybe there's something else going on. And this is where etymology allows us to determine what's going on. So in this case, we have this, uh, this base, L-A-T-E, and it forms the words relatives. So what does a relative have to do with I the idea of being born or carried? Again, it's a little bit more of a metaphorical idea, but the word relate itself came from the idea of carrying something back. So if I'm going to relate one thing to another, I'm going to carry that idea back to whatever it is that I'm going to talk about as I relate it. Um, and then relatives became people who was, that was used for, for people who we can kind of carry our, our ancestry back to and, and see who we're connected to. So again, it's often a metaphorical use, but there it is. Um, so we can look at the word relatives, we can look at the word related, and how does my student know to spell relatives with an A? It's if she thinks about the fact that relatives are people that we're related to, people that we have relationships with. So in both related and relationships, I think that's, yep, we've got that A that is very, it's stressed and clear and in relationship, we don't doubt that we wouldn't be likely to spell an E, for example, we know that it's an A. Um, that allows us to go to the word relatives where this is schwad and understand why the A is there. Now, this has always been something that structured literacy practitioners have worked with. They understand this, we understand this. Um, we often will ask kids to try to think of a related word, but sometimes that's tough for kids to do, especially our dyslexic kids who are trying to pull, you know, sometimes have that word retrieval difficulty. They may have think that they know a particular word, but maybe they can't think of it. So one of the things that the matrix does is it makes it super concrete and super easy to show these relationships and make it very, um, very clear and give kids a chance to do explicit practice on connecting those 
words together so that, that then they never make that mistake again. It's it, they understand it, they see the relationship and they can, uh, can, can call on it when they need to spell the word the next time. The other thing that's interesting is in the word relationships, the stress is here on this A and our A here is schwad. And the opposite things happen with relatives. So in relatives, the stress is here and, and our E is very clearly pronounced. We're in relationships, the schwa is there. So this is what happens as, as we add and remove suffixes. We see pronunciation of elements changing and we see the stress moving from place to place, which makes the schwa move from place to place or maybe sometimes more than one schwa. So we can see, we can connect these words together. The other thing is we even see a change in pronunciation in this T. So in relatives, it's right, it's a t as we would expect, but in relationships, that T becomes a sh. So again, it gives kids connecting this L-A-T-E in relate to relationships allows kids to understand exactly why it has to be a T and can't be an S or anything else that they might consider as an option for that particular syllable. So we can then take this, this um, what I would call a stem, R-E-L-A-T-E, that we can add all kinds of suffixes to, to get things like re related and relationships. We can do the same thing with T-R-A-N-S, this idea of carrying across. So when we translate from one thing to another, what are we doing? If we translate from two languages, we're kind of carrying a meaning across from one language to another. Um, when we collate, we bring things together. We carry things together, collating papers or whatever it may be. And then again, we can build all kinds of words. And this isn't really even all of the different prefixes and suffixes we could use with this space. These can grow as students encounter new words and they can anchor them to a spelling that is very familiar and that they understand and can use as they create these long words that are combined where the elements are combined very consistently. So morphology can explain a schwa. It can also explain sequential identical consonants because we often will have consonants that are doubled for different reasons or double for different reasons. So we might have a doubling convention that's been applied. We might have um, a situation where a base just has two sequential consonants at the end. And then we will have situations like this where we have two consonants that are the same, but it's because they are from two different elements. So dissection is explained by looking at the DIS and the SECT and the ILN. But I really wanted, I really appreciated the student's error of D-I-S-E-C-T-I-O-N because that's such a reasonable um, error. Think about the word bisection. I pronounce the word dissection as though it has a long I, dissection. And the same, that's the same way we pronounce bisection. So why isn't the, it just a D-I, S-E-C-T-I-O-N? In fact, there is a D-I that this is, has a sense of two, and this also has a sense of two. So students who've gotten to this point may know, well, there's dioxide. We talk about digraphs, two letters that function together as one grapheme, like an S-H. And then we even have something like a dilemma, where a dilemma etymologically has this idea of having to make a choice between two different things. And the lemma has, a, there's another whole story with the L E M M A. So notice that D-I-S-E-C-T-I-O-N for dissection would be perfectly reasonable from a pronunciation point of view. But what we have to do is look a little bit more deeply at what all of these elements are doing and contributing to the meaning of the word. And doing this can be fascinating and I'll, again, begins to unlock lots of vocabulary. So the S-E-C-T in dissection has the idea of cutting or cut. Um, and, and so if we bisect something, we're cutting it in two. If we would have a D-I that was a base, we could talk about dissecting being cutting in two, but dissection is not actually cutting in two, it's cutting apart. So when we're dissecting something, we're cutting it apart. And this D-I-S then brings this idea of apart. So one of the things that's really important as we look at morphology is to remember that prefixes can have lots of different senses. They often have one that we're very familiar with. So we might introduce a DIS prefix, for example, with the idea of not or the opposite of. So when we dislike someone, we don't like them. When we disobey someone, we are disobeying. Um, when we disable a machine, we prevent it from being able to be run. So None of these have a sense of a part, but many other words will have a sense of a part for that dissection for the DIS. And there can be other 
senses that that prefix can bring to words as well. So um, if we look at dissect, we see that this has a sense of a part and we see the same S S S in a DIS with an S S S at the beginning. In other words, like descent and dissolve. Notice the pronunciation difference. I say dissect, I say descent, and I say dissolve. Now everyone may pronounce these words differently, but notice the vowel pronunciation may shift and the pronunciation of these S's may also shift from S to Z. And in a sense, they're not shifting, they're just varying depending on which, which word they end up in, which word family they end up in. So it's really interesting then to, to be able to go a little bit deeper into these words and understand where these are coming from. And the, re, the way we can know the sense that a, a base or a prefix or a suffix is bringing to English is we consult etymological re references. They don't give us the answer, but they give us a lot of information that helps us understand what's going on in English today. Because etymology is really about the history of words and we have to analyze words as they exist in English today, which may have changed dramatically from how they used to be. But this provides clues and information to help us understand. So we see that in Latin, and I'm only giving you a little bit of the entry from etymonline.com, which is a fabulous etymology reference, where he's talking about, the author is talking about um, how this word was used in Latin. And in Latin, it was it was formed as a dissecare was the word, and it, it came from a D-I-S that meant a part in Latin, and the secare that meant cut. Um, so we can see that in Latin it had the sense of a part, and as we think about what dissection is, it definitely has that same sense today, that we're cutting things apart. Um, the word descent came from a D-I-S that, that was used to mean differently in Latin, with sentire, to feel and think, which sentire, you can see, to um, begin to get an idea of what the, the English base might be, we often remove this, these inflectional suffixes from Latin, the IRE, and that leaves us the S-E-N-T that we actually see here in descent. Now that again, that is not the same S-E-N-T as I sent a package yesterday. It is a, a bound base that we see in words like sentient or sentimental, uh, things that have to do with feeling or thinking. And it's a twin, meaning we have an S-E-N-T and an N-E, S-E-N-S-E, -S that come from the same Latin origin with this idea of sense, S-E-N-S-E. -S -E. So um, this here we have a D-I-S that has a sense of differently. Then we have another one with the idea of a part. So when we're dissolving something, it's like we're loosening something. We're, we're loosing it, we're untying it and, and letting it come apart. Um, so it's really important that we think about all these different ways that a prefix can be used as we introduce them to students. Um, I want to show you one more, and this is not a D-I-S-S, -S, but it's, it's a good example of how a D-I-S, as opposed to meaning not, can actually mean exactly the opposite. It can bring an, a, a completely opposite sense to a word. So this word disturb comes from turbare, which means to uh, disorder, to disturb from a Latin word that meant turmoil, and this the word turbulent, think of the turbid, turbulent, um, even um, perturb, I'm perturbed, all have that same base, T-U-R-B. And the prefix here does not mean not disturbed. It means exactly the opposite. It means extremely disturbed in, in a lot of turmoil. So um, when we introduce a DIS, for example, which is often going to happen with words like this, where it has the sense of not, we want to be careful that our introductions, which is very appropriate, are not leading to assumptions that students are going to carry with us or that we're going to carry with us. So it's really important to know that prefixes in particular can bring lots of different senses. And one of them is often just an intensifying. This completely is in a sense an intensifying prefix where it's just giving us more of a sense of that base. So then we, we can look at um, dissection and section and talk about how something intersects. And my favorite is insect because it has this idea of cutting in and that's why an insect was named in Latin because it looked like it was cut into with those three different parts of the body. So it explains um, sequential identical consonants Notice it's bringing up lots of vocabulary. And 
it can clarify grapheme choice. So why do we have an SI or TION, excuse me, an equation, not an SION? Why do we not need that J in educational? So an equation, really the simplest way to explain that is just to look at its relationship to equate. But many kids do not have a sense of equate. That's not a vocabulary word that kids use. It's fairly a high register word. What they do use a lot is other words formed with this base EQU. This is also a bound base. And anytime we see an ATE, we might ask, we might want to ask ourselves, could that be a suffix? And in this case, it is, and etymology shows us this, it's the same base that we find in equal. So we can introduce a little tiny um, uh, matrix that explains this. And as we go along, begin to build it. Because look at all these math words that come from this EQU. We have equal and unequal. We have equation and equivalent with this base V-I-L-E, base in value that has the idea of worth. So when something is equivalent, it has equal worth. See how the, the, the definition of that word is right there in the morphology. And then even words like inequalities, which can be very challenging to spell if you're just looking at this word, but notice how clean all of these pieces are, how common and repeating they are, and how students can learn to synthesize them. Uh, this is my favorite educational because at first I thought maybe the student just stuck a J in there because she was trying to be safe. Um, but I also thought, well, she could know words like prejudicial, so maybe she just wasn't sure if it was a D or a J. And then I thought, well, maybe she wondered if it was a DJ, a DG, like a knowledgeable, educational, prejudicial, but she maybe made a mistake. And I, and then I thought, well, that's got to be a, a, she just wasn't really thinking because there's no, there are no DJs in English that spell J. But of course I was wrong. And if you think of adjust and adjourn and adjacent. So once kids develop a lot of vocabulary, they often have more ways to misspell words. And we wanna show them how the structures will completely explain this. We also wanna show them explicitly things like a D in node, shifting to a J in nodule or grade and gradual so that they are primed to expect these kinds of shifts. Because now we can see that the D-U-C-E in here is the same D-U-C-E that we have in induce and produce and deduce where that D is really clear. And in educational, it's shifted to a J. So we can, we can do so much with morphology and helping students understand spelling and get a deeper sense of the vocabulary that they are learning. So the question then is how do we include this from the beginning of instruction? Because that may all look really interesting, but I was working with words from an eighth grader and you might think, you know, I don't think we can get that working with first graders, it's too complicated. But we really wanna just begin to introduce the concepts so that kids are primed to expect this. One of the best ways to do that is to analyze the words that we categorize as irregular because often those words are explained by morphology. Sometimes they're also explained by etymology, but morphology explains lots of really interesting words. So for example, the word nothing is something that we would teach kids to just remember because that O is not pronounced the way they're expecting it to be pronounced. But we can analyze it as N-O and T-H-I-N-G. Now that's not actually how it was originally con constructed. It was a compound in Old English of none and thing, and none had the sense of not one. So nothing was not one thing became the word nothing. And, and the spelling shifted a little bit. But today I would I would be very comfortable explaining that story and then analyzing it as the N-O, which is a base, and then T-H-I-N-G as two elements because it will help students understand it. If we think about no thing and nothing, it makes perfect sense. And they can use the pronunciation of the O in no to understand why we use that O in nothing. Same thing is true with any. Any is actually analyzable as A-N plus Y. And this is Again, etymologically verified, and you can, you can show this, but it's really interesting to see that we can see it in the grammar as well. So we might say, do you have an egg? Do you have any eggs? We can see how both of those are determiners that come right before a noun, and we see the same thing with a. Uh, do you have a cookie? Do you have any cookies? They kind of work in the same way. And there are relationships in meaning and in usage between this a, uh, an, and any, even though the pronunciation is different, we see the same A in all of them. And these are actually two forms of the article and they use the same vowel grapheme, which shows us that relationship even though the pronunciation has changed a little bit. 
And I actually have written about these, these words plus many and the, because you can teach all of those in a very uh, kind of organic way. And there's an article on that on the website, Learning About Spelling, if you're interested in, in seeing more about that. So um, that's one thing that we could do. We can talk with irregular words. And there are a number of different irregular words whose spelling is explained simply by looking at the morphology. We, we have to be comfortable saying that the pronunciation is not what we expect, but when we look at the spelling, it's totally logical. So we can start there for teaching these words. And what that does is it explains the spelling, but it also prepares kids from the very first exposure to a word like any or a word like does or a word like says that they're going to see that this often happens in English that words are elements are spelled the same way even though their pronunciation is shifting. The other thing we can do is we can take the words that we're using in our systematic instruction that may be part of an explicit or um, you know kind of organized sequence and just expand them a little bit to show kids these structural ideas. So for example, the first time we introduce the word play, we introduce an AY grapheme and we get to the point where kids can read and spell play, they can read and spell say, we can show them how we can expand these. Now we don't need to expect kids to be able to spell all the elements that are in here or to read them, but we can put them up on the wall and begin to get them thinking about structures of words. The matrix does such a beautiful job of showing us this idea of structures being connected to one another. So that we can take play, playing, and plays, and now we can do say, saying, and says, and show them the spelling making sense, and discuss the fact that, oh, you know what, that pronunciation has shifted, but that's going to happen a lot in words. You're going to see that all over the place. You already know how to pronounce the word says. What you need to know is how to spell it, and it's S-A-Y, I say, and then you add that S to say, she says. We can also talk about um, phoneme graphing relationships, right, because in this word says, we have two different pronunciations of the S. We have the one that we think of as the most uh, expected, S, but we also have the one that occurs actually more in, in, often in English, which is the Z for an S in says. So we can use that to talk about phoneme graphing relationships with a context that kids can remember. The other thing we could do is take words that we've taught kids to, to read and to spell, um, like cat or fish or shell, where once we get those short vowels and we have the CBC words, and we can begin to combine them because that's often one of the first ways we introduce morphology is through compound words. So we could look at catfish and shellfish and talk about the fact that those can be analyzed as C-A-T, F-I-S-H, and S-H-E-L-L, F-I-S-H. We can also then begin to talk about something that happens throughout English, which is that when elements are combined, they don't always mean exactly the same thing as when they're by themselves, or they can, they can kind of contribute different things to the meaning of words. So we can talk about what a cat is and what a fish is, but when we put them together, we get a catfish, and how is that different than a cat? What's, what's going on with that catness in catfish? Same thing with shellfish. Because a shellfish, we think of a fish, right? When we think of the surface definition of fish, it's a particular thing. But shellfish is a little different. And this is where that orthographic denotation can be really powerful. Because if we look at the orthographic denotation of fish as an element, F-I-S-H as an element, it's really used as an animal that lives in the water because we have things like shellfish and starfish. And a fish is where that free base is used as a word to mean a particular thing, but it carries a slightly deeper sense in words like shellfish and starfish. The other thing we can do that's kind of fun then is give kids a word and, and ask them to analyze these words, then ask them to look at something like selfish. Now make sure they know what the word is, right? Most kids will know the idea of selfish. So there's an F-I-S-H in here too. Do you think that's the same as in catfish? Could we put this S-E-L-F-I-S-H in this matrix for F-I-S-H? And they will see right away that no, the, the base here is not F-I-S-H. It's not that part. It's this part. It's the S-E-L-F. When I'm selfish, I'm thinking only of myself. So it gets kids 
to think a little deeper than that idea of the word within a word, because here's a word in this word that has nothing to do with what it means. And we see that a lot. So we wanna prime kids to not just think about the word, but to say to themselves, does that connect to the meaning? And, and then also as they get older, develop the research skills to be able to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check, is that related? Cause I do that every day and most of my colleagues do too. And we wanna develop that sense in our kids so that they are able to verify some of these connections for themselves. The other thing we can do, because I mentioned um, the idea that morphology can help clarify graphemes and phonemes and their relationships. So we can look at the fact that in the word fishing, we see an SH and that SH is a digraph. It is a unit in the written language that corresponds to the sh in the spoken language. So we see that in fishing, we can analyze fishing. But then if a child encounters a word like mishap, and we might show them this word because they're probably not gonna encounter this themselves so early. I wonder if that's an SH there too. Is that an SH digraph? And we can clearly see that it's not when we, when we separate it. We can see that in mishap, the S is representing S and the H is re representing H. And those just happen to be next to one another. The morphology allows us to say, oh, that's not a digraph because they're in two different elements. They can't be the same, they can't be one thing because they're coming from different, different elements that have been put together. And we might think that mishap is kind of a tough word to introduce to kids, but in fact, kids use this base, which, which used to be a free base, but today is really kind of more of a bound base all the time in words like happy, happen, and perhaps, again, perhaps, may, may, you probably don't see your first grader saying perhaps, but they, I'm sure they've heard the word and they certainly know the words happy and happen. They're gonna need to apply the doubling convention to get to those words, but they can see this idea of chance, luck, and fate. And again, the word happy doesn't necessarily mean someone who's lucky, but it used to. And we can kind of talk about, we can kind of see that connection. And when something happens, it's maybe something that just occurs by chance. If we say perhaps, you know, if we're lucky, perhaps we'll be able to, you know, go swimming this afternoon because it's not going to rain. So we can show these words to kids. And again, we're building an awareness of the structures that build words that are in so many words that we often don't even realize are complex. Complex meaning that they can, are can, composed of more than one written element. All right, so we'll wrap up then here with this quote from, um, again, Speech to Print, where Dr. Motes wrote in her re most recent edition, awareness of morphology then supports word recognition, word memory, and word recall above and beyond phonological awareness and orthographic awareness. By extension, it also contributes to reading comprehension through word recognition and vocabulary and written expression through spelling and word choice. These cognitive realities imply that morphological word relationships should be directly and explicitly taught. And we know that that is one of the most foundational aspects of structured literacy, that we are going to directly and explicitly teach kids how words work. Along with the phonemes and graphemes and those relationships, we want to show them how morphology frame those relationships and allow us to understand them. She also writes here that teaching words in a derivational family together in a vocabulary or spelling lesson. So by derivational family, what that means is taking a base or, um, you know, or a, either a word that is a free base or a bound base and showing how we can form many different um, words from that, that teaching those together in a vocabulary or spelling lesson and rehearsing their pronunciation is a valuable instructional practice. So how are we going to do direct and explicit teaching of morphology? Well, the first step really, we just were able to scratch the surface here today, but to learn more about morphology. So you can frame the work that you do with students. So you can frame your first introduction of a prefix, DIS, so that kids are learning what they need to learn today, but also being open to what is eventually going to come about with, with those different morphemes that they're working with. Um, you can show students structural elements from day one by finding them in words they're already looking at or by adding them to words and just showing them what they can anticipate as coming. We want to show students, and this is super important, that elements are spelled consistently while pronunciation often shifts. If we can shift from calling says and does irregularly spelled words to calling them 
kind of unexpectedly pronounced words, we're going to make a huge difference because then we understand that the spelling is anchored in the morphology and the pronunciation may have shifted, but we can understand the spelling. And I would recommend that you work with matrices and word sums. They're super valuable resources. So we're about to wrap up here, but if you wanna learn more, you can visit my website. I have on the further resources page, I have a lot of information about other webinars and things that I've done and other people have, have done. I'm actually working on a book. If you wanna follow at the website, you'll get information when that comes out. Soon is a relative term, but I'm hoping that's gonna be soon. And you can always contact me here. And so I really thank you for being here. And I look forward to now talking with Janet um, about some of the questions that we might have on this topic. Thank you, Sue, that was great. I do have a couple of questions so we can chat for a little while if, if that's okay. Um, you know, you did a, a great job morphology into lessons. Is there a scope and sequence for teaching morphology or is there a different approach that works best? Well, I wouldn't say there's a scope and sequence. There are some key concepts that need to be introduced. And those concepts include some of the ones that I just talked about. So the idea that, that words are spelled by combining elements, that those elements are gonna combine in consistent ways. And we already do that as part of structured literacy. One of the concepts I would suggest that people can introduce is this idea that it's not an irregularity to see the pronunciation of an element shift, that that's often gonna happen and it's part of the system. And it, it kind of explains why we have this one-to-many nature so that in dissolve, we can pronounce, we can spell z with an S and in zoo, we spell it with a Z. Well, in dissolve, it has to be with an S so that it also can represent the word solve. So just introducing those concepts as a starting point. And I, you know, with, with structured literacy, you, you often already have a scope and sequence for what you're introducing. So just be thinking about how to bring morphology into that and integrate it into everything that you're doing so that kids right. understand it. Thank you. Um, also, I think you did a great job explaining how teaching morphology um, is, is, you know, an integ integral part of structured literacy and how helpful it can be for students with dyslexia, but how might morphology lessons help a student who doesn't have dyslexia? Well, the, the example of the one I gave you of that, that eighth grader, that student did not have dyslexia, or if anything, had a very mild case of dyslexia. So some, it, it, it helps kids with spelling. I literally to this day cannot spell accommodation without thinking AC, COM, MOD, and then go on because why are C's and M's, why do we have, you know, two C's and two M's in accommodation? And I've misspelled that in a, in a meeting where I was kind of embarrassed because I wasn't thinking structures. So for all of us, it enables structure. It also really allows kids to go deeper into vocabulary and understand vocabulary at a deep level. It can, when we get into talking more about etymology and those orthographic denotations, it can help us with synonyms like why do we use one particular synonym versus another? And often, as soon as we learn kind of that deeply embedded sense, we think, oh, of course, that's why we wanna use this word instead of that word. Um, so that, that, so it helps in lots of ways. And as someone who, who absolutely loves words, I could spend, you know, I would have been so happy if my early elementary reading classes had included more of this because I just think it's fascinating. It really um, is. It really is. <laughs> um, especially with the boxes that explain the bases and, and, and the building blocks. It, that's just a, a great visual. Um, do most literacy programs used in early grade, especially gen ed classes, include morphology in their instruction? They usually don't. And the reason is that we are trying, and I mean, it's, it's for good reason, right? We're trying to start with the basics. We're trying to get kids started on reading. So we start with those phoneme graphing relationships. But what we've found in what the research is showing is that it's so much more effective to bring that in from the very beginning. So it's challenging sometimes because, the, you know, if someone's working with a particular curriculum or program, it's not going to be part of all of those things that you're being asked to do. But what I tried to do today is show you a few ways you can be thinking about bringing that in and just priming kids um, to understand. And it sounds like you can do it in a really organic way where the words come up either misspelled or the word comes up and it's a new word. So thank you so much for those suggestions. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. I'm grateful, Sue, that we have your knowledge. Looking forward to your book coming out and um, 
look forward to talking with you again about this because I'm sure that we only scratched the surface today. Um, so thanks you for, for sharing your knowledge with us and thanks everyone for joining us. I wanna remind everyone before you leave to check out IDA's digital library at dyslexialibrary.org and our stream, streaming service at idatv.org. And again, just a friendly reminder to register for DyslexiaCon 21. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day, evening, morning, wherever this finds you and join in again for another Motivational Monday soon. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.